What's going on everybody? You know who it is. This is Austin and this is the Austin Smith Real Estate Podcast where we talk about real estate and we talk about lifestyle. Today's show, uh, I know I've had uh, funding episodes in the past, but this is going to, usually they're dealing with some type of hard money or some type of lending company, but today I wanted to discuss the four ways that you can fund your next investment purchase or you know investment opportunity so that way you understand that you do have options and it's all about just matching the right tool for the particular job so this is another solo show another individual show but nonetheless i wanted to bring this info straight to you a little bit of housekeeping just before we jump into the meat of this thing if you or anybody that you know has benefited by listening to the austin smith real estate podcast please leave me a rating and review on itunes let's continue to share this message let's continue to push this and if you know anyone that can benefit by coming on to the show and be able to add value to the listeners Please shoot me a text, send me an email, give me a call. Let's get them on the show. Gal, guy, does not matter. Without further ado, let's get into the show. Today's show, four ways that you can fund your next investment opportunity. Four ways. And we're just going to rapid fire. We're just going to go right down the list. Some of them you know, some of them you don't know, or knew but didn't know that you didn't know. And then I'm going to jump into kind of the pros and cons, advantages, disadvantages of each. To start with the four ways that you can fund your next investment property, we're even going to split the four funding types into two separate categories the first two categories are going to be kind of your traditional route using fha using conventional and then you have the creative side which more deals with the hard money and or private money so let's jump into this the traditional routes These are the easy ways to get financing because they're going right after your personal information, kind of your traditional loans, FHA, conventional. These are your, you know, your standard mortgages or standard loan opportunities that whether you purchase a regular single family home with it or whether you purchase your next investment opportunity these are mortgages that are readily available to you just by filling out an application they'll look at your you know debt to income ratios your financial worthiness and will determine a value or a pre-approved amount that you could essentially go after i want to focus on fha specifically 203k And the main reason why is because it is a renovation loan. And when it comes down to properties, renovating properties, it's a great loan to use while only having to put 3.5% down. Now, when I would see more so beneficial on the investment property side not so much the flipping side. And the main reason why is because with FHA, number one, as part of the stipulation, if even if you're going after 203K, it has to be an owner-occupant. You are going to sign a form that says that you will be living in the property, will occupy the property for at least a year. So you can see how they're more beneficial with multifamilies where obviously for a flip, you'll be getting in and out in in a transaction. If you were to try to flip a property with an FHA loan, it's not to say that you can't do it, but you also need a six-month seasoning period from the time that you 
purchase the home that you're going to fix up and then the contract to purchase that home from you. If you were to say, buy a distressed property on January the 1st, you cannot receive an offer to purchase that property that you're rehabbing and now putting it back on the market to flip. You cannot receive a written offer for six months. So not until June the 1st can you receive an offer. Not to say that's a major issue. However, all in between that time frame, what if it only took you a month and a half to finish the renovations? Now you have to pay. Now you have to hold on to the property. You're paying all these holding costs. You're even paying the mortgage for another four and a half months until you're able to receive an offer that in this case would probably take another 30 to 45 days to close from that point. So you're probably looking at like a July or even an August closing. When you were done with the project, you know, Feb- mid-February, the beginning of March. So you see how FHA may not be the best for 203K, but when it comes down to a multifamily in the same scenario, if I were to purchase a multifamily, use FHA 203K to fix it up. So say, for example, okay, we'll give you my property, one of the, my first property. Bought it for two hundred and forty-five thousand. We put twenty thousand dollars into it to finish the basement, and we rented out the home. And a year later, we increased our equity by about forty-five to fifty thousand just in that year just by taking some renovation money, fixing the house up a little bit, and now we have a decent equity position within the property. But you can see how FHA, at least 203K, allows you to you know, renovate the property, increase your equity, and then be able to hold on to it as a rental income producing asset. That's FHA. It's a good product. It has its pros and its cons, but it is one of those products that a lot of people overlook, especially on an extremely distressed property. Don't be afraid of it. Now, obviously, there's you know there's other stipulations that if you already used an FHA loan, you can only have one house in an FHA loan, things like that. But explore your options. There are some opportunities, especially with FHA 203K. Conventional, conventional loan. Uh, for first time home buyers, you might be able to have the option of putting down three or five percent. If this is not your first property, then you're looking at, you know, your 15 to 20 percent down payment. Now, they do have renovation loan options, which is another good opportunity. You'll just have to factor it into your numbers. Unlike either hard money or private money, which, you know, or the creative finance inside, which I'll get into in a little bit, they usually only charge interest only monthly payments. So that way your holding costs, and for those that don't know what their holding costs are, holding costs are the expenses that are incurred during the renovation process or during, you know, after you closed on the property, the costs that are associated, you know, that are associated on a monthly basis are usually your interest payments or your mortgage payments. In in the traditional financing case, it's the mortgage payment. Um, in your creative side, creative side of finance is more your interest only payments. Um, so you have those payments. You have your taxes. That's not going anywhere. You have your homeowner's insurance. That's not going anywhere. Um, any type of utilities that need to be kept on or, you know, turned on. Obviously, people are working on the electricity. You know, you're going to have to have the electricity on, things like that. So those give you an idea of what your holding costs are going to be on a monthly basis. So going back to conventional uh, and even FHA on the traditional side, uh, a bulk of your clo- uh, holding costs, I should say, are going to be your monthly mortgage payment. And that's one of the biggest key differences in 
the mortgage or you know, going after traditional financing and going after creative financing, um, your monthly payments or your monthly holding costs might be slightly more expensive simply because on the traditional side, you're paying a, a mortgage payment, which is your principal interest taxes and insurance. So you're going to be paying a mortgage payment. Keep that in mind. Um, 20% down, so just factor that in as far as your return on investment, as far as your ROI. But at the same time, like I mentioned before, it is one of those loans where you can go straight to the bank, fill out the application, they'll run your financial information, and then you will get approved for a specific purchase amount. The other thing just to keep in mind when going after the traditional route is that with investment properties the extremely distressed ones especially the hot extremely distressed ones ones that might be in the perfect prime area and it's just the ugliest home on the best block those opportunities they go fast so could you imagine if the seller of that extremely distressed property in the best area of the neighborhood, if he knew that his property was hot and he was trying to get the best deal in the shortest amount of time and it came down to investor A and investor B, you being investor A and looking to close with your traditional financing and in this case maybe 30 days 40 days when investor b can close in two weeks or a week then you might be at a disadvantage so that's another key point there's the two key differences between going after the traditional financing and the creative financing traditional financing one you're going to have to worry about your mortgage payment as part of your holding costs and when it comes down to closing and when it comes down to speed on how quickly you can close traditional financing fha conventional will usually always take about 30 to 40 days to close so that will be two things just to keep in mind. Those are the two key subtle differences between the two uh, financing options. So that's your traditional side. Outside of that, the process is still the same in regards to closing, running title, um, inspections, you know, same exact process. Moving over to more of the creative side of the financing, which is more of the better options when it comes down to funding your next investment opportunity. You have hard money or you know lender portfolio lending. You have hard money and then you have private money. Hard money are usually individuals that have formed a company that specialize in short term lending, usually for investment projects. And hard money lenders are individuals or a company who will lend on your deals or your investment opportunities based on the asset. This is asset based lending. While your traditional financing techniques, they'll look at your personal information and the creative side of financing is more asset-based lending. They will look at the asset and put more weight on the asset rather than your personal financial situation. Now, they still will look at your credit, your work history, your current financial health, but that's no longer number one priority or it's not indicative of whether they will still choose to lend on your specific investment opportunity. The current invest, uh, the current rehab project that I'm getting ready to start over here in East Orange, it I'm not putting any money into the deal. They're not running my credit. They're not looking at my financial information. They've asked for real basic, you know, well, they know I, I'm in real estate full time and, you know, they have an idea of, of projects that I've completed, 
But that's about it. But only because it is a slam dunk deal. They're okay with, you know, even if I, even if I'm not, you know, I'm not in the position where my credit sucks or, you know, I make $25,000 a year. But if that was the case, they still would most likely be interested in taking this deal on. And the main reason why is because, like I said, it is a great deal. They will be able to make a good chunk of change on the particular deal. So it works. So on the creative side, Hard Money, they are a company or a lender or an individual that is willing to provide short-term financing at higher interest rates in order for you to be able to get the deal done. They'll usually charge points, which are percentages of the loan. So, for example, if you hear a hard money lender talk about one points, two points, three points, four points, these are basically percentages of the loan that will be charged as a fee. So, for example, if you're taking out, you know, a hundred thousand dollar loan from the hard money lender and the points are three percent, then three thousand dollars would be a fee that's part of your closing costs, which some of your closing costs usually entail those types of points, any type of prepaid taxes, attorney fees, you know, um, title search fees, anything that deals with, you know, running title on a particular property, um, any other, you know, miscellaneous fees that are attached to you obtaining the funds. But those all go into, you know, part of your closing costs that you will factor in your analysis on whether this is a good deal or not. Outside of that, hard money lenders, hard money people are great resources when it comes down to finding money they'll always the only di- uh, the ma- a good difference between them and the banks is that they're always 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 going to be willing to lend on a good deal while the banks mortgage companies traditional financing they don't care how good the deal is if you don't qualify financially then they're not going to give you the loan and that's, you know, that's the subtle difference. And that's why a lot of people go to go to uh, either hard money lenders or private lenders, which we'll jump into in a second, in order to find financing for their investment deals. The um, and the only other thing, like I mentioned before, in regards to the interest only payments with the traditional side, you're going to be paying the mortgage payment. That can be a lot of money on a monthly basis. When it comes down to private money or hard money, you're usually paying interest only. So imagine if they were just charging you the interest on a monthly basis. Sometimes it cuts that payment in half as far as your holding costs. So something to think about, something to factor in your analysis. Private money, private money is almost the same thing as hard money as far as like structure, um, you know, it being asset based lending. But the major difference is with private money that can come from anybody. It doesn't necessarily have to be a company. Hard money, com- you know, hard money lenders, companies, brokers, you know, they are regulated. They have to abide by certain laws. They have to uh, obtain certain licenses. They have to obtain certain paperwork. They're more regulated. Private lender can be your mom or your dentist or a business partner. Private money can come from whichever source. It does not matter. Hence the term private money. Here's the reason why private money is always the best scenario. Private money is always the best scenario because the terms are a lot more negotiable than if you're dealing with a particular company if you're dealing with a particular hard money lender broker company they might already have their set criteria in place their set rules their set systems in place and you might not have a lot of negotiating or wiggle room around those particular uh, protocols but with private money since everything 
is, you know, since you're, you know, going to be talking to an individual that you know, like, and trust, the negotiations, the uh, details of the transaction can be a lot more, you know, a lot more flexible. You're able to negotiate a lot more better. Um, and like I said, private money, you know, if you get into a real good harmonious relationship, then, you know, it's as easy as picking up the phone, asking for the funds, and then the funds are getting deposited into your account in order for you to make your investment purchase. No applications, no verifying of credit income, none of that. And, you know, private money is always the cheapest form. You, you might not have to worry about as many, you know, points. Like even when you're discussing points, you don't have to worry about closing and therefore no closing costs. You don't have to worry about points adding up to the bill of your closing costs. You might where you know, you might have interest, you might have an interest only payment. You might ha- not have to worry about paying anything until the transaction is complete. But at least you have options with private money. Um, the project that I'm getting ready to start now is basically private money. And the numbers and the details of the transaction couldn't have gone any better or any any more favorable. I wish every single deal would be like this. But uh, that is the benefit of using private money over hard money. But you'll see why the creative side of the financing kind of trumps over the traditional side of uh, financing. Um, And then I would like, and even I would say like, you know, the bonus method of funding your deals, which doesn't even really count, but the bonus would be your own cash. You have your own cash, you can do a lot of damage. I would say cash is king. I use, you know, that's usually a, a pun or a term that's used in the real estate business a lot. Cash is king. But, you know, over the past couple of years, I don't believe that cash is king. I believe cash is king when you're in a multiple bid situation. Um, and the only reason why I don't think cash is king is because I'm kind of changing my mentality and I want to have the cash flow is king mentality cash flow you can have all the cash but if the cash is just sitting there and if you're not doing nothing with it then that's another story so cash is not king cash flow is king but anyhow in that 30 second rant nonetheless if you have your own cash you call the shots you make the rules you take the bigger cut, the biggest cut. Profits are all yours. Don't have to worry about interest. Don't have to worry about closing costs. Well, no, actually, you will have to worry about closing costs considering that you're going to be buying the property from somebody. But you don't have to worry about points as far as adding to the closing cost bill. You don't have to worry about making a phone call, hoping that your private money, hard money, you know, you know, if you're using hard money, hoping that your hard money lender gives you enough favorable, you know, numbers to work with. If you're dealing with private money, hoping that that individual has enough and that they're not lending on other projects and now are strapped for cash. When you have your own cash, you call the shots, you run the show. But that's a bonus because most of us, um, you know, when taking on these projects might not have all the cash. And not only that, sometimes you might want to use the bank against itself and use leverage. You might come out with a more favorable return, but it's up to you to run your numbers. So those are four ways that you can fund your next investment property, four ways that you can get the deal done. A lot of people you know, when it comes down to the deal versus the money, I tell the people all the time, don't worry about the money yet. Focus on the deal first. Focus on putting yourself out there to start attracting opportunities. If you attract opportunities, 
you can find out how to fund the deal later. Because even if you spend the time now connecting with individuals for funding, connecting with hard money lenders, speaking with your mortgage rep on the traditional side, calling up a team of, you know, three of your best buddies to put together, you know, private financing. Even if you do all that, if you don't have a deal, then nothing's going to get funded. Even if you had a million dollars to work with, if you don't have a deal, nothing's going to get funded. That's dead money. So focus on ways that you can find deals. Focus on ways that you can position yourself in front of other investors as someone who buys homes, who's someone who also invests. Keep putting it out there into the world, into the universe that this is what you would like to do. And when that opportunity comes to you, you'll be able to analyze the numbers with those four uh, financing options. Over time, you'll, you know, you'll be able to find out what your bread and butter and what your go-to resource. But in the beginning, find the deal first. Find distressed property first. Then run the numbers. Then try the different financing techniques. Does this deal work better as a private funding deal? Does this deal work better under fi- uh, under um, under hard money? Is this a multifamily that I want to live in? Does 203K work best? But if you don't have the deal, all the other analysis kind of goes in vain. So find the deal first. Then run your analysis. And that'll set you up for future success. As always, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, want to pick my brain, want to ask if I know any private or hard money lenders, give me a call, shoot me a text, send me an email. I will be here to serve. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Austin Smith of the Austin Smith Real Estate Podcast, signing off.